All right. First reading comes from 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7, verses 1 through 14. Now, when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people, Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him. Listen now to the word as it comes to us in the gospel according to Mark. Recalling that last week we read of how Jesus sent out the disciples in pairs. The apostles gathered home to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of Jesus. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Skipping over to verse 53, when they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat there. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized Jesus and rushed about this whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever he, they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Jane, I'm not sure about your family. My own family found a house at the lake in the early 1960s. And from the very first day that my mom found that house, she kept a journal of what we did every day. And we used to chide her, summer after summer, saying, Mom, every day we go swimming. Every day we go sailing. Every day we go water skiing. Why are you keeping this journal of those things? But over years, we came to realize that Virginia's gospel had in it things that we'd forgotten and helped us to keep track of what year was it that they landed on the moon? 
What year was it that we built the garage? What year was it we took down that big tree? When did we meet our best friends? When and how, how many times did it take falling in the water before we were first able to stand up on water skis? We realized that gospel was important to us. The gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, describe something like that journal. Instead of saying that on May 31st, we met so-and-so, it describes that Jesus met Nathaniel, who claimed, can anything good come out of Capernaum? And on this day, Jesus healed a leper. And on this day, healed two people who were blind. And on this day, he healed a woman who had been bleeding for 12 years and also a child who had died when not yet 15. Over the years, our family grew up at that house. And that house became a place that we would come back to every year. We began having family bashes in which everyone would come and we'd have a great celebration at the lake house. And then we began to date and to bring our wives home and our children. And these became wonderful homecomings in which all the generations gathered together. But after 30 years of those gatherings with all the family together, our parents said, could you stop? Could you just come with your family and not with your brothers? Because we want to have time with each one of you. And we can't do so when you're all gathered together. At 80, we can't hear everybody and be present with everyone. Jesus sent out the disciples two by two. And they all came back, telling him great stories of all that had happened. It occurs to me this morning that as much as we remember building the garage and taking down that tree limb and meeting our friends, that that was our house. God was making a house out of us in all those experiences, just as was described to David, that it's not about the building or the structure or the organ or the windows but is instead about our relationship as the people of God, generation after generation. We are the house of God. We are the body of Christ in this place. Over time, there have been incredible works of art in the church. As Sandy and Marianne brought back for us photos of the statue of David, the Sistine Chapel, beautiful works of art, I have several old Bibles that have lithographs in them of Adam and Eve being ejected from the Garden of Eden with an angel with a flaming sword keeping them out, of Elijah on Mount Carmel competing with all the priests of Baal. There's a famous painting by Warren Solomon of Jesus with long brown hair and a white robe standing in a garden at night, but there seems to be light there and he's knocking at the noblest door to our hearts. There's also another painting of Jesus as a portrait. It's of a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. In another church that I served, there was a family in the church who so loved that painting that they wanted to have a memorial of buying a painting that was seven feet tall of the portrait of Jesus. They wanted it to be behind the pulpit. They wanted this beautiful picture of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus staring out over the congregation. But the church called a new pastor, and he thought it was tacky. So he moved it to the library, except that the library was a room with only a seven-foot-tall ceiling, so the picture dominated the entire space. And it caused great controversy that he had dared to move their painting of their Savior. Years later, I came to the church and seeing that it really didn't look right in that library, asked if we couldn't put it in the gathering space, which had a tall ceiling and was not immediately in the sanctuary, but everyone would see it coming and going. And it fit that space. And people enjoyed it. And the family were pleased that they could have that image of Jesus. There are many, many different images of the Bible. One I have never seen is a painting of the disciples coming home 
as apostles returning. I wish that there was that painting where there was beside the shore of the lake this great olive tree with all the leaves dancing and shimmering gray and gold and green and beneath it sits Jesus rooted against the tree. And the disciples are gathered there, at least eight or ten of them, in pairs, looking absolutely exhausted. They've been about their journeys, but each one is talking at the same time, very animated with their hands, of their great journeys. These are men who for generations have lived at this one lake, and all of their work and all of their lives and all the generations before them have been in this one place. And suddenly they've seen the world. And they have so much to tell, such great adventures of all that they've seen. They were able to extend the faith. They were able to preach and tell the stories that Jesus had told. They were able to heal the lame and those who were deaf, to pick up serpents and not to die. And they were in awe of all of this. In that painting, off to the side, you would see storm clouds beginning to form because there's a storm coming and there on the shore would be the empty fishing boat by which they'd come across the lake. And there would be people there who already look very hungry because they haven't eaten in a long time. And over on the other side are crowds coming around the lake, thousands of people bringing with them stretchers with the lame and the blind and leading those who are wounded and hurt to come to Jesus. But Jesus isn't paying attention to all the stories that the apostles are telling. He's not looking at them. He's not looking at the storms. His eyes are focused on all those in need, keeping an eye on each one of them. I think that painting would be called Distracted because we tend to be distracted with all of our stories, all the things in our lives, all of our accomplishments, just like the apostles. Or we're looking for the storms that are about to come. And we rarely pay attention to those who are in need. I'm told there's been a cultural development in China that the question we're all so familiar with of people coming up to you and instead of saying hello, say, how are you? And the response now in China is not to say, I'm fine, or okay, or good. Instead, it's to say, I am very busy, thank you. Repeat it after me, please. How are you? Isn't that what we all do? We describe how busy we are, as if to be happy, to be successful, to have a full life, we have to be busy. And it's all about our accomplishments. It's all about our successes, as if we could find salvation by all the stuff that we do. And we're not happy, and we're not satisfied, and we won't find salvation if we stop or wait for God to bring it to us. There's an old fable that I just made up that describes that in the beginning, God formed every creature in the universe. It was not a nothingness, but there was a waste and void, and God called light, and there was light, and God called the waters to separate, and they did, and God spoke to every different thing, and it came into being as God called them. But over time, people forgot to listen. The creature that God loved the most of all that God had created was the woman and man because they were so much like God, because they had within them the spirit of God that God had blown into them, but even more because God delighted in their being in relationship to God. But people became distracted by their own voices and they stopped listening to God. And thousands of years went by, and God seemed to not speak anymore. And finally, after a long, long time, God said, I will speak one more word, just one word, and all creation hushed to listen. If God was going to say one word, 
And that's the last word God would ever speak for all time. What would that word be? And God said, Jesus. To some, it was folly. To some, it was meaningless. But to those who believed, who saw through Jesus the path to God, that one word is love. That one word is compassion. That one word is empathy. That one word is peace. That word is communion, of truly being present with the world, with one another, and with God. So often, we are so busy. All we hear is ourselves. We need to listen for Christ in our lives, for God calling to us to be present with one another.